The parabola is defined as the set of all points such that the distance from a point to the directrix equals the distance from the point to the focus. Here's our parabola. There is a point inside the parabola called the focus and a, a line on the opposite side of the vertex called the directrix. And what the definition is telling us is that this parabola is made up of all the different points so that if we looked at the distance from a point to the focus, it would be the same distance from that point straight down perpendicular to the directrix. So if we take this point right here, let's pick a line from this point to the focus, and that will make a line from this point down to the directrix. And the lengths of these two lines equal. And this applies to any point that we pick. Let's pick another point and show. And if you have a ruler handy, you could actually put it up to the screen and measure and see that these two lines have the exact same length. But let's pick a different point and check that out too. Let's choose a point close to the vertex right here. The distance from this point to the focus, and then the distance from this point to the directrix. This distance is always measured as the shortest, so the line is perpendicular to the directrix. And these two lines have the same length also. So each of these points is placed so that the line from it to the directrix has the same length as the line from it to the focus. A result of this shape is something that we see in satellite dishes or in flashlights. With a flashlight, the focus would be where the light bulb is placed, and the parabola is the mirror disk surrounding the flashlight. Points coming from the focus or the, f the light bulb will hit the parabola and come out at a nice straight line. So imagine the light bulb at this focus has rays of light going out in all directions, but any of these rays that are going toward the parabola are all focused outward in the same direction, giving the light bulb a nice solid beam of light. And it works opposite with a satellite dish, where the focus would be the receiver. And any radio waves coming in from the top are going to hit the satellite dish, the parabolic shape, and focus those rays back into the focus where they can all be received. The actual distance from the focus to the vertex, we'll call that distance P. And from this definition, we know that P is also found as the distance from the vertex down to the directrix. So this quantity P, it's important for us to know what that is. So given the, the equation of a parabola, we know exactly where to find the focus. We just showed a way to find the vertex, and now we'll talk about a way to find the focus. Let's look at some forms of equations of parabolas. Here are four standard forms of an equation for a parabola. Let's start with the first one. What we're used to really building off of is y equals x squared. We know it is a parabola with the vertex right at the origin. Pardon another bad sketch of one. It's good enough. We know it's touching there at the origin. Now if we can put this equation into the form x squared equals 4py, we'll be able to see exactly that value p, the distance from the vertex to the focus. So comparing these two equations, we can see that in this equation right here, what is 4p? Well, this is a coefficient of 1. So we're saying that 4p equals 1, so p is 1 fourth. That tells us that the distance for this parabola from the center to the vertex is a distance of 1 fourth. And the distance down to the directrix below is also 1 fourth. So our standard parabola y equals x squared, p equals 1 fourth. Our second form here, y squared equals 4p times x, is simply a parabola that is now symmetric on the x-axis. So we would see it opening to the right. Our last two forms are forms where the vertex is not necessarily at the origin. We still know that our vertex is found at hk. So seeing it in this form, we'll be able to quickly identify the x and y coordinates of the vertex, as well as the quantity p, which describes the distance from the vertex to the focus and from the vertex to the directrix. Now let's go to the circle, which is defined as the set of all points x, y that are equidistant from a given point called the center. So our circle is all these different points that have the exact same distance to the center. Here we're calling it at the coordinates h, k. So any straight line we draw from the center outward, as long as we keep that line the exact same length, we're going to be extending this line to points on the circle. 
So this is why we're defining it as all the points that are equidistant have the same distance, and all those points will end up forming the points on the circle. Let's look at some equations for circles that we have. These equations should look very familiar to us. x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared. Very, very basic equation of a circle. And once we need to start accounting for shifting the circle to a new center, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. The radius is still found by our quantity on the right side, taking the square root, and our center is at the point hk. Yes, we were using it for a vertex at hk, and now we're calling it a center of a circle. We will know whether it's a vertex of a parabola or the center of a circle by the context. Remember, a circle has x squared and y squared. The parabola we just looked at had either x squared or y squared, but not both. The ellipse is defined as the set of all points such that the sum of the distances to two given points called foci or foci is a constant. The center of an ellipse is the midpoint of the line segment between the foci. So we start with some point a center and we also have these two points foci. They are on either side of the center. The ellipse would be made from finding a point and the sum of the distances to the foci is a constant. So if we take a straight line from the point to one focus and then a straight line from that point to the other focus, we find that that distance will be the same for any point on the ellipse. I could pick one back here and do a straight line to one focus and then a straight line to the other focus and the sum of those two lines will equal the sum of the two lines from this point. And all the other points on the ellipse are found that way. Now, an ellipse is similar to a circle in that they are both closed shapes with no corners, no vertices, just a round kind of a shape. But a circle, we would see that going from the center to the edge was the same distance all the way around. But an ellipse, it's not like that. Let's focus on what we see horizontally and what we see vertically. Horizontally and vertically. Let's take a line from the center and vertically go to an edge. And let's do it again from the center down to the edge. This is the minor axis because we see that it is shorter. It would be the major axis if we go horizontally and, and spot that that is the long side. The major axis does go through the two foci. The minor axis would be the smaller side. No foci on the smaller axis. And some distances that we are interested in would be that on the minor axis, we'll call this distance b from the center just to the edge on. It's always going to be horizontal or vertical for the ellipses that we look at. We won't look at ellipses that have been rotated in a certain way. So we'll know that one side, the short side, will have a length b. The long side will have a length a. And we're talking about the length from the center all the way to a point on the ellipse, the edge. The distance from the center to the focus is actually the distance c. We won't take this idea too much further, but we can express the quantity c as c squared equals a squared minus b squared. So we won't take this quantity too much further in our examples. We will be paying more attention to these quantities a for the length on the major axis of the center to an edge of the ellipse and the quantity b on the minor axis from the center to a point on the edge of the ellipse. Now let's look at four standard forms of an equation for an ellipse. I'd first want to point out that we do see an x squared plus y squared, which is pretty similar to what we saw for the equation of a circle, but now we have the variables in fractions. And in the denominator is where we're seeing those quantities a and b. So first of all, let's talk about the difference between these two forms. A always represents the length on the major axis. So this top one tells us that our ellipse will have a major axis on the x-axis, or let's at least just say a major axis horizontally. Down here we're seeing that A representing that major axis length from center to edge of the ellipse is now under the y variable. This would be the case where our ellipse has more of this shape, where the major axis is vertical and the minor axis is horizontal. Now hopefully we can recognize the meaning of these two forms of equations. 
they are for those instances where the center of the ellipse is not at the origin. It is at the point HK. So we're still identifying a center as HK. We'll know that we're talking about an ellipse, not a circle, because now we see some fractions that have different quantities. Let's take a second to point out one quick thing. What if the quantities A and B were the same? What if we saw x squared over 4 plus y squared over 4 equals 1? We'd want to first see the center is at the origin, that we don't have an h and k, no quantities being added or subtracted to our variables. So let's go ahead and do a crude sketch. The center is at the origin. Now A tells us our major axis. Here we're saying on the x-axis, remember, squared, so we have to think the distance is 2, not 4. The distance is A. Our denominator is A squared. It's very similar to circle where on the right side we saw an R squared, but our radius we have to do square root. Very similar idea. So on the x-axis, two units from the center to the edge of the ellipse, and on the horizontal axis in the negative direction, two units to the edge of the ellipse. Now y squared is also over 4, so a and b are both equal to 2, and that's actually going to give us a circle. If I can try my best to fill this in and make it look like a circle. So how does this connect to what we've already talked about with circles? Take this quantity, this actual entire expression, multiply every term by 4. And that will show the equation x squared plus y squared equals 4. But if we're talking about a usual equation for an ellipse where a and b do not match, let's say we had x squared over 4 plus y squared over 25 equals 1. First of all, there's not a way that we can multiply a number to make this become an x squared plus y squared equation. And if we think about how we would sketch the graph, again, it's another bad graph, but on the x-coordinate, distance from the center to an edge is 2 units, and on the y-axis, the distance from the center to the edge is 5 units. And now we're seeing how we get more of the elongated, the oval ellipse shape. So we'll be paying attention to the denominators being different. That's how we'll know we have an ellipse. If the denominators turn out to be the same, we can actually simplify it this way to look exactly like our form of an equation for a circle. Now let's hit the last conic section, the hyperbola. And I know we've gone through a lot of information, but after we talk about hyperbola, we'll talk about real quickly what main ideas you need to know to be successful at the problems that we're about to face. The hyperbola is defined as the set of all points such that the absolute value of the difference of the distances to two points, again they're called foci, is a constant. So with ellipse our definition was, was a sum, a constant sum. Now we're saying that the difference is constant. The absolute value of the difference is constant. And our shape now is no longer a closed shape, it's an open hyperbola. The hyperbola is defined as the set of all the points such that the absolute value of the difference of the distances to the two given points, the foci, is a constant. It's similar to the ellipse where we said, find a point and talk about the distance to one focus and the distance to another focus, add them up, and that will be constant for all the points around the ellipse that we find. With hyperbola, we're talking not about adding up those distances, we're talking about subtracting those distances. So from some point, if I find the distance to one focus, and then I find the distance to the other focus, and I subtract, I find the difference, I will get a quantity that, that will be constant for any other point on either branch of the hyperbola that we choose. We choose a point and say the distance from that point to one focus, subtracting the distance from that point to the other focus, we will get a constant. Now there are a few other aspects of the graph of a hyperbola that we need to include. The branches of the hyperbola actually run along asymptotes. These two diagonal lines cross at the center and they show us where the branches of the hyperbola go when x and y values are large. Here are the two asymptotes drawn in and we see the branches of the hyperbola do run alongside these diagonal lines. 
I want to add a little bit more to this graph where we are looking at the line that goes through the two foci and the center, and this is called the transverse axis. Now I want to create a box around the center that is going to barely touch the two branches of the hyperbola and will have corners that hit the asymptotes. That box will look a lot like this. If I can figure out how to draw this box, then I'll know I can draw asymptotes through the two corners and that will give us enough information about what the graph of the hyperbola looks like and we'll definitely go through an example of that. But I want you to know that this box will have a short side and a long side just like the ellipse had a major axis and a minor axis. Let's point out those quantities. Just like with the ellipse, we'll talk about the distance from the center to the long side of the box as A and the distance from the center to the edge on the short side will be B. And the transverse axis could be horizontal or it could be vertical. So let's look at the forms of the equations for those different cases and then we'll get to some things that we can actually start to break down and do. Once again we have four forms of equations but they are all related and do similar things especially when we compare them to the equations we've seen earlier. Again, we see an x squared with a y squared, but this time we see the minus. That is a great clue that we do not have a closed shape, like a circle or an ellipse. When I see the subtract, I can begin to think hyperbola, that we'll see two branches that are not connected to each other. Aside from that, this equation looks exactly like the equation of an ellipse. We see our quantities a and b. The only difference that we need to spot is the subtract instead of the add. If I was to make the graph of x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared, again, another bad graph, and we'll start making more precise graphs very soon, but I just want to point out how a and b would work. Again, if this was a plus, imagine a plus right there, it becomes an ellipse. So we know on the x coordinate, we go out a units. Let's say a was 9. Let's actually write this out x squared over 9 plus y squared over 25 equals 1. Now I need to point one thing out and make sure we're on the same page here. Now that I've chosen x squared over 9 plus y squared over 25, now the denominator of y is the larger number. So actually this is now of this form right here. It's x squared over b squared plus y squared over a squared. a is always the larger number when we look at how we handle these different graphs. Okay, so we know on the horizontal axis we're moving three units left, three units right to get to the edge. And the y axis we are moving five units up and five units down. And that would give us, when we connect those points, try to keep it nice and smooth, we'll see the graph of an ellipse. But now let's go back and say this is not an add, this is actually a subtract. So we know that it's not an ellipse, we know that it is a hyperbola. Let's do it in a different color so we can really see the similarities. We would still start off by saying I see under the x squared a 9. So horizontally I need to find three units out to the left and to the right. Under the y we see a 25, so up and down each direction five units. But now, since it's a subtract, not an add, we don't want to close these points up into an ellipse. We actually use these points to make that box in the middle of the hyperbola. So I make a box, it's not actually part of the graph, it's just going to be our guidelines for the hyperbola. Next, we know that the asymptotes go through this box corner to corner. So let's draw in these asymptotes if we can. There and there, not too bad for a really bad crude sketch of a graph. But now that we see these asymptotes, we can begin to sketch the graph of the hyperbola. From this point here, we go upward and begin running out alongside the asymptote. So we do this four times, up and down on the left branch, up and down on the right branch. Now, the two branches that we've just made in purple are actually the only parts of the graph of the hyperbola. Everything else just guidelines to let us know where these branches go. So our final graph does not include these straight diagonal lines or the box. Those are asymptote lines, and the box really helps us identify where those lines are. 
So what are the other equations for? What we've done here is an example like this form of an equation here, where the longer axis is vertically, a is always larger than b, so our larger number was found under the y, we're stretched more vertically, and b was the smaller number, so we're not stretching as much horizontally. In terms of how do we get an ellipse that doesn't have our branches on the left and right, but instead up and down, this can exist, all we do to see that would be something that looks like y squared minus x squared. Again, the denominators just tell us which side is kind of longer, horizontal or vertical. If we start with x squared, we know our branches of the hyperbola are on the left and right. But if we start with y squared, our branches are up and down. And these two, hopefully, we can start to get the idea by now, ways to show us how to do a parabola where the center is not at the origin, but the center is at the point hk. So it will be helpful for us to go through several examples and really point out the small differences that we see between these equations, and we'll talk about how to start making some sketches of the graph.